Uh, Chairwoman, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Hodes, I was very interested in your answer to Senator Collins' question about the state of uh, research regarding Alzheimer's. Let me ask a, a, an additional question. Uh, what's the latest in the research? What does the research show in regard to the connection between Alzheimer's and uh, uh, Down syndrome? Uh, is that connection still um, viable? And are we learning something about uh, both at the same time? Yes, it's a very important connection uh, between two very important conditions that we need to address. And, and as, as many may know, individuals with Down syndrome, likely related to the fact they have an extra copy of chromosome 21, have uh, as they age. And, and, and the good news is, of course, that those living with Down syndrome now age into older adulthood at a very high proportion develop Alzheimer's disease. And there's been an extremely active program uh, designed to, to study this, a, a, a network of longitudinal studies looking at biomarkers to understand how disease progresses in Down syndrome and establish a network for clinical trials. And, and clinical trials are already in progress. For example, looking at the effect of a, a so-called GMCSF, it's a, it's a, a growth factor, a granulocyte monocyte uh, growth factor as therapy in those with uh, Down syndrome, preventive therapy, as well as behavioral exercise intervention. So we're working all the way from the basic science connecting the trisomy of Down syndrome and the relationship to the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's through clinical trials infrastructure and, a and active clinical trials. What would be the outcome if, there, if this connection is determined? What, what would change in the way that we would then uh, address the issue of, of Down syndrome? Well, certainly as, as Down syndrome relates to risk of Alzheimer's disease, this becomes uh, similar to the, the rare but tragic early onset autosomal dominant Alzheimer's uh, and, and other aspects where we, we know with high priority, high probability that individuals will develop Alzheimer's. We know that years in advance. And importantly, now that we have biomarkers to track the presence of disease early, allows us to intervene early in these populations to prevent. Uh, thank you. My, my following questions really are about process, mostly data. Um, this could be to Dr. Hodes or to you, Dr. Bertagnoli. With all the data that's now available in, in many instances, but related to Alzheimer's, electronic health records, diagnostic texts, clinical treatment results, insurance claims, medical images, is there a way now that NIA uh, can harness that data to uncover new insights and patterns that we can't see through individual research projects? Um, maybe that's my question. Is that being be, done? I can be, as you, as you wish. I can begin, uh, and then certainly uh, uh, Dr. Pernioli can, can, can amplify upon it, because uh, you're absolutely right, real-world data, of the, the kinds that you mentioned are critically important to our fully understanding in an inclusive way what goes on with the health of the population, the way to maximize it. There have been some very important real-world data studies already carried out uh, around Alzheimer's disease. And, and importantly, I would say that now the promise more than ever is for us to leverage these real-world data initiatives in the context of the large data initiatives, NIH-wide, federal, and federal agency-wide, uh, that I think Dr. Bignoli can comment Doctor, upon. Doctor, that's really was going to be my so, question. So, yeah, I'll be, was, uh, and I'll, that? I'll be quick. The data we use has got to be good enough that we can make life-altering decisions based on it. Right now, our real-world data is not at the, of that level of accuracy, frankly. We are working really hard with FDA and with partners across all of HHS to convert our current ability to gather real world data into one where we really can harness it appropriately, use it with new analytics like artificial intelligence to make life altering decisions. Right now, it tends to be more hypothesis generating than testing and we're going to fix that. And the, the issue is not sufficient data, it's the determining how to harness that data to get it in a form that it's valuable? It's not necessarily efficient, it's the accuracy and the interoperability, you know, you gotta compare apples to apples, not apples to oranges, and you know, some issues with how the messy data is in the clinical environment that can really lead to mistakes if Thank it's you for not using a scientific Thank term you. that I understand, apples <laughs> and oranges. Thank you. Uh, finally, just maybe make a statement because of the shortage of time. I, I raised this uh, in last year's or previous year's uh, hearings with Dr. Tabak. Um, ARPA-A, uh, at one point in time, uh, the funding of ARPA-A was at the expense of more traditional and clinical uh, research at NCI. Uh, I hope that that's not a pattern. 
I assume that you will say that uh, it depends on how much money you have, but I want to make certain that you are prioritizing NCI competitive cran uh, cancer grants uh, with, 25, with FY25 funding. Dr. Berg Tegnoli. So, yeah, so absolutely we are, and our relationship with ARPA-H is that um, we um, have our team members meet routinely to review uh, what's happening in our sister agency and make sure that there is no redundancy, and in any way we can amplify, we do so. That question was also directed to you, Dr. Rathmill. But, that, but that's what I would say as well. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. 